Hello. Know me. My name is Amanda Sauer. I'm the president of Phi Alpha Theta, which is our History Honors Society, and I'm here to introduce Dr. Al Marashi. Um, Ibrahim Al Marashi is an assistant professor here at UC at Cal State San Marcos. He's the co-author of Iraq's Armed Forces and Analytical History. <laughs> He obtained his PhD from the University of Oxford, completing a thesis on the on Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. He is an Iraqi American who has lived at various times in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey. And he has traveled extensively through the Middle East. And here is Dr. Omar. Okay, thank you. I, I want to start off this talk with an image that came out uh, in last over the in response to the events of last week, the Bar uh, Boston Marathon bombings. Okay, and what is this kind of road sign challenging? Was a notion that emerged with the field of media studies, media studies or communication, for example, that department that we have on this campus. You have to realize it's a post World War II phenomenon. Uh, the, uh, the ability to teach communication and media studies came from a desire to uh, an analyze how did communities fall for the propaganda and rhetoric in societies such as uh, Mussolini's Italy, Nazi Germany. Okay. The understanding when the field of communication studies first emerged was the media was a reflection of reality. Over time, and the point of this lecture is to show you that the media is not a reflection of reality, as this sign is reminding us, but how the media constructs reality. Okay. In other words, something has to have developed over the last, I would argue, since the beginning of modern warfare in the 20th century, whether it was from world, where did we come from, from World War I through World War II to the 2003 Iraq War, and 10 years later, what is the direction between publics and governments and mainstream media? In other words, how is war constructed for the public? Okay. Just to remind you how far we've come in history, we often see this iconic image without realizing that this iconic image had to be produced. It did not emerge spontaneously in society. It was not a product of society. It was a product of government-sponsored bodies designed to communicate to the public the need to sign up for the war effort in World War I. Remember, America at this time was very isolationist. The notion that America now had to sign up for World War I was something that had to be sold to the public. Little do we know is that this iconic image of American culture was actually copied from an original British image of Lord Kitchener. It's the same process. Images like this had to be constructed by quasi-government bodies. And the notion of quasi-government bodies is important because just as quasi-government bodies sold World War I, so too was the 2003 Iraq War, I would argue, sold and justified by quasi-government bodies. Now, why is the notion of quasi-government important? The people who construct war for us are not elected officials. They are media professionals. They are advertising specialists. They are writers who are hired by governments, usually for short period of times, and then let go once the war is over. In other words, just as products are sold to publics, so is the process of engaging in war. You've probably heard of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Who you associate Conan Doyle with what? Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Okay. You probably don't associate Conan Doyle with selling the British public World War I. In other words, how does an author of Sherlock Holmes get involved in selling the war? It's simple, he was a writer, and a writer meant he was an effective communicator. Just as he could engage audiences in his mystery stories, surely he could engage the British audience into seeing why Britain's role in World War I was justified. We remember Doyle as the writer. We don't remember Doyle as that quasi-government <coughs> official selling World War I to the British public. Uh, in fact, uh, Doyle's son fought in World War I and died. After the war, he reflected on his role, the irony that he was selling the war to people like his own son who volunteered and died in the process. Coming up with the famous line, if anyone wonders why our sons died, it is because their fathers lied. 
In other words, we lied. We sold propaganda to get the sons to join up for the fight, and they died in the process. But nevertheless, these images become iconic in American culture, so much so that we make fun of them without realizing the process of where did these images emerge, okay? <laughs> Darth Vader isn't engaged in World War III, of course, this is with Pulp Fiction, but it's just to show you that, how these kind of iconic images become ingrained in popular culture. The same thing with Rovi, uh, Rosie the Riveter. This is not an image or a person that kind of emerges spontaneously in popular culture, okay? We see the image, we recognize this, it's iconic, but we rarely read the fine print. The War Production Coordinating Committee is producing this image. We produce this image, we even use it to this very day, of course, now in a, in a different context. But nevertheless, we rarely question the history of how war is sold. And it's usually the same story. It's usually quasi-governmental bodies that are experts at selling and usually get hired by governments during wartime. Okay. And that will bring us to the story of the Iraq War of 2003. Uh, let's go back in time. It's February 2003. It's on the eve of the uh, actual Iraq War that began in March 2003. And let's remember some of the ways that the threat of Iraq to American security was presented to the public. The most famous case of, we could say, the argument for war made in a concise fashion was epitomized by Colin Powell's speech to the United Nations Security Council. Here was Colin Powell in front of the United Nations, charged with basically delivering America's case for war why Iraq is a clear and present danger. It was in this argument that the case that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction arsenal posed a clear and present danger to American national security. And of course, words are just words, but it was the kind of theatry, uh, theater, the pageantry of his presentation that really in, you know, etched in the American mindset the threat that Iraq posed. And the most iconic image during this presentation was when Colin Powell said, all it took, all it would take is this much anthrax to wipe out a block of downtown New York. Okay. So whatever he said, okay, it was that image that presented the Iraqi threat because this was a weapon that could cause mass panic. This is a weapon that there was no defense for. And now remember kind of back to the days of Cold War history. During the Cold War history, of course, the American public was scared, but they could do something about it. You had a whole literature telling the American public what to do when a nuclear strike occurs. Okay. This one is pretty logical. When the bomb goes off, don't be there. Okay, okay, that's fine. You could do your best. But remember, there was a whole you know, mindset around the Cold War scare. You, you know, what can you do? If you're on the street, apparently you can jump out of the window. Uh, or, you know, if you're in a building, you know, hide behind your desk, that would save you from a nuclear attack, apparently. But the scary thing about anthrax, and what made the threat so concrete, was that anthrax was not concrete. Okay. Anthrax, that by, you know, this would be caused by, you know, interballistic missiles crossing the North Pole and to hit the American heartland. Okay. There was a notion that, you know, there would be time to prepare. Why was anthrax so scary was, of course, it's a spore. You can't prepare against it. There is no weapon to fight against a spore. Nevertheless, and this is sometimes when, you know, the, the education of the public sometimes is important, and particularly when science is important to understand how, you know, threat perceptions are sold to publics. The thing about anthrax is uh, it's a biological weapon. And the important thing, and particularly around the 2003 Iraq War, I, I had to go back to my science to understand how kind of these threat perceptions were being constructed. Anthrax, by sheer nature of being a biological weapon, means it's biological. It can only live for so long. Okay. Now, the latest we knew that Iraq had access to anthrax was probably the late 1980s. Okay. And, of course, how does America know this was because, yeah, there was facilities in Maryland that actually had sold the cultures to produce biological weapons uh, to the Iraqi state. Uh, if there was no way Iraq could actually have living anthrax by 2003. Okay, that was the other element. And what is not told was that anthrax is quite hard to disperse. Okay. We saw what the actual anthrax scare due to the, with the envelopes. 
where a kind of disgruntled member of a U.S. military facility was actually sending out the anthrax. Okay. It was quite hard to disperse. So that even if you had this much anthrax, it couldn't necessarily, you had to invent the means to destroy a New York City block. That didn't exist. The point is those scientific nuances weren't you know, known in the American public. Uh, the point was it did scare the American public to believe that Iraq was a clear and present danger. When the actual war started, and you have to keep in mind, when the actual war started, the war that was presented to the American public, the way it was reported, okay, wasn't simply a reporting of the facts. We weren't simply getting information. There was a battle here, this is, you know, the weapons were fired, such and such weapons were fired, this is how many casualties were occurred on both sides. It was much more than that, okay? Actual events that transpired on the battlefield and how they get repackaged for the American public is an entire process worthy of study in and of itself. So to make this point, let's look at the beginning of the Iraq War. The Iraq War wasn't simply a war, a military conflict, but I would argue that the way our mainstream media presented it to us, they presented it to us almost as a narrative, as a story with protagonists, antagonists, and catchphrases. How many of us still know this term shock and awe? Okay. Now shock and awe, again, get, where does this notion come up from? Okay. It's not produced in the public. The notion shock and awe was a term deliberately designed within the Pentagon, within the Pentagon's communication office, to describe America's military might prior to the war. Okay. It's not a phrase that came out spontaneously from the community. Okay. The Pentagon spokesperson said, when the Iraq war begins as a way to intimidate it, America's military might will shock and awe the American public. It was a rhetorical weapon, if you will, a weapon of kind of psychological persuasion. But we use it in today's parlance without realizing where it emerged, just as we use the notion of a blitzkrieg in football. Okay. Without realizing, yes, what was Blitzkrieg originally describing? German you know, military campaigns, the way they overwhelmed the enemy. It becomes kind of banal. Okay. But it's all part and parcel of these kind of people who are designed to justify, sell war, give us the language of war. Shock and awe. Uh, how often is it used today in today's parlance? Okay, you could have a used car salesman having an ad saying, our low prices will shock and awe you. If you ever saw the, saw the show Desperate Housewives, I remember there was one episode where Brie Van de Kamp was saying, I'm going to use shock and wah against her rival housewife. Okay? So it's an example of how the war isn't simply narrated, okay? but that it has a language of power of its own. But nevertheless, remember what the, sh the shock and awe was going to describe. Okay. It was going to describe the initial phase of the war. And the initial phase of the war almost kind of followed the narrative structure of a three-act film or a three-act movie. We had a teaser, this massive strike against a compound that believed, you know, we, you know, intelligence believes Saddam Hussein was staying in. You had a lot of explosions for the first night of the war. But of course, Saddam Hussein wasn't in that. And now our story is going to continue. The actual war occurs. We had protagonists in the war and antagonists. We had villains. Okay. And conveniently enough, the Iraqi villains actually adopted helmets that looked like Darth Vader's <laughs> helmet. That's why I showed you that image of Darth Vader in the beginning. So you not only had the, I mean, the Iraqi soldiers made perfect antagonists. They wore black. They had Darth Vader helmets. And of course, they were these kind of enemy legions that were serving the, dark, you know, the evil force, the evil emperor, if you will, Saddam Hussein. And of course, the way, and yeah, we even have people don't realize Lego figures from these. Fedayin Saddam, these soldiers of Saddam Hussein. And then, of course, we have the protagonists at the same time, okay? In other words, this imagery isn't just spontaneous imagery. This is imagery crafted to create the protagonist, okay? And, it, you know, the whole ending of the war, which will be on May, which occurred on May 1st, 2003, when Bush landed on an aircraft carrier, was very much kind of an event made that you would also see at the end of Star Wars. You know, Darth, you know, Luke comes, you know, back after destroying the Death Star and mission accomplished. And it was the same case with the 2003 Iraq War. The evil senator Saddam Hussein, his statue falls, Iraq has fallen, the Death Star is destroyed, if you will. And of course, you have to have some kind of ceremony to signify that the end of our story has occurred. Now, 
let's go back to uh, another smaller episode that was I was involved in. Okay, in other words, when I'm talking about selling the war, I know this because I have first-hand experience in selling the war. I lived through the process of selling the war. When I'm talking about these quasi-governmental bodies, I'm not speaking of conspiracy theories. I was involved in the process of trying to debunk some of their roles in the lead up to the war. It's interesting that we can say, it's, kind of, it's also a sad testimony to say that crack.com becomes America's kind of media that still remembers how the war was sold to us. This is 2012, so more than 10 years after the event. Okay. And what is this kind of crack.com article saying? It's five clues hidden in computer files that can get you busted. Okay. And what are, do they report on number five? Okay. Word document reveals that the Iraq invasion was based on plagiarized college essays. Okay. So who was the author of the plagiarized college essay? That's yours truly. Okay. <laughs> so what, what is this crack.com article talking about? And why is this episode so important to kind of make us realize about, you know, realize the process of constructing war. It was simply this, a uh, chapter two of my thesis when I was writing it in Oxford was about how Iraq under Saddam Hussein stayed in power during the 1991 Gulf War. Okay, that was it, it was simply an article, and one of the few articles at the time uh, describing how Saddam Hussein stays in power. Uh, what happens is a person in the British government is charged with writing a dossier. Okay, dossiers by the British government were a joint American-British effort to produce these kind of intelligence documents, released for public consumption, showing the government, the, uh, the government showing the public that this is our intelligence that proves Iraq is a, that proves that Iraq is a threat, and that war is justified. So what happened in, in the case of this kind of British-American cooperation in producing the dossiers, where three dossiers were produced, the second one proved problematic. So with the first and third. But the second one proved problematic prior to the war because it was revealed that it had been copied from my research. In other words, what happened was somebody in the British government who was saying that this is intelligence work is actually recycling material I had written. Now, why was that episode important? Because in the British public, it was important because people started asking, if the British government is selling us the war based on material from a PhD student, then this is not intelligence information. In other words, what the government is revealing to us isn't kind of this classified information. You're recycling old information. If this is being kind of constructed out of thin air, perhaps there's something wrong with the entire case that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> that was the question asked in the UK. It was not the question asked in the US. And so that's why I find it ironic that one of the few articles that deals with this issue in the American context is this, you know, it's not the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, it's crack.com. Okay. And yeah, it only generated, I think my little episode, it generated one political cartoon. Because when Colin Powell was also showing that vial of anthrax, he was also waving my article in the air, which was that back then a UK intelligence document saying this is you know, showing that Iraq is a threat to the American public. Anyway, uh, what happened after this affair? Uh, you have it, even this episode that I'm involved with uh, in the film called In the Loop. Uh, keep in mind uh, this actor, he'll come up later in our lecture, uh, the guy from Sopranos. And, but in this case, a parody, if you want to watch a parody of the events that led to the 2003 Iraq War, In the Loop is a good case that shows how the quasi-governmental figures in the state are involved in the process of selling the war. Yeah, I was depicted as a young intern rather than a PhD student, and I was played by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> I wish. No, this is, this is supposed to be me. They, they changed me into the fem female intern. But uh, anyway, I, I have no control. Now, this is kind of to show you how this little episode, how the interpretation can change, OK? And this is now getting to more of how the Iraq War was also a capsule of changes in the history of communication. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the best dis uh, description I've ever heard of the kind of how to describe postmodernism 
was by a professor of science fiction and literature at a university who said the best way to describe postmodernism as a condition is it's a condition of the easy edit. Okay. In other words, well, how he describes the postmodern condition is anything can be made with an easy edit. Whether you can now in the you know slice parts of the DNA and the genome to create new uh, bugs, uh, prevent diseases. But in, in the terms of literature, he was saying anyone can be an author in this postmodern day of the easy edit. Okay. And so we could say on one level, a good part of the 2003 Iraq war was kind of emblematic of the postmodern condition in that not only could a government dossier, uh, of course, be cut and pasted from a student work, but allowed authors to also emerge from the public, from within the public. And I'll show you examples of that. But before we go into the, the process of allowing the public to become authors during the debate of the war, I just want to show you kind of how, number one, why this case was important, for me at least, was because it allowed me to get a public setting to you know, debunk some of the myths of the war. So this is kind of a summary of what I said in front of the British Parliament, because the British Parliament was uh, made an effort to question how was the public duped into believing that there was WMDs in Iraq and how the war was sold to the public. But it, I, I just want to show you that in one case, the World Socialist website takes my kind of testimony to show that the war argument was furious. But then I also want to show you something else, and we don't re remember this website too much, but it's called an in, it's called Indie Media, and this website is important, and I'll get to why for a reason, but can also show us the other aspect of remembering the war. Okay, and of course here what we have on this language of this website is quite interesting. This is from you know Santa Cruz, California, but. Who is responsible for the Iraq War and 9-11? It's this crazy former U.S. student with the suspect name of Rahim al Marashi, who wrote this awful and sneaking dossier so these poor hocus folks, Bush and Blair, had to raid Iraq and kill over 15,000 evil crimes. Okay, his English is perfect. He collaborates with Al-Qaeda and bin Laden for this diabolical plan to lure these great nations into a trap. He is responsible for average daily... Anyway. He is a personification in Satan and the world's biggest terrorist, God bless us. Anyway, now the point of the kind of, it's not the kind of how I got involved in this conspiracy theory, but how one person can use a website called Indie Media to get his voice heard. And this is also kind of what I would argue the postmodern condition. The 2003 Iraq war, we, we don't realize, not only did it give us kind of a disastrous war, but in terms of the history of communication, it's, remember, it's this war that made <laughs> Any random person able to upload their views on a website and get an audience. You have to realize what we take for granted, the blog, the web blog, had a history. And how did the web blog get its attention? It was due to somebody known as the Baghdad blogger, okay? who was a computer, simply a computer savvy person in Baghdad. But what he wanted to do was get his voice heard. In other words, when you know this narrative of the Iraq War was only coming through these mega mainstream media channels, here is one person who says, "How do I get my view within Baghdad to a global audience?" And that's where the blog comes in. This is well before you know you had companies that made ready-made blog templates for you. He develops his web log or his web diary of the Iraq War to get people to read what is the condition of an Iraqi during the 2003 Iraq War. We could say the birth of the block, probably the technology had always existed, but the means of the block, having every person have the potential of becoming an author and uploading on a website and have their voice heard as long as that person can attract an audience, is also one of the legacies of the 2003 Iraq War. And it emerges in the context of somebody, one person trying to develop a counter narrative a counter narrative to how the war is being sold by much larger corporations, whether it's media corporations, or governments for that matter. It was the case of one single voice, okay? But that one single voice being heard among, among voices that were much louder. That was voices coming from governments and media corporations. What does this mean for 10 years later? And now I'll, I want to bring in the Boston Marathon attacks, because I want to argue the processes of reporting on those attacks 
were very similar to the dynamics that occurred during the 2003 Iraq War. In other words, what is the state of communicating conflict? And this is what it comes down to 10 years later. It's pretty abysmal. Uh, I would say there hasn't been a learning curve. Okay. And the first case I give you is what happens with the Boston Marathon attacks is, again, the search for the antagonist. Okay. Who is to blame? Who is the enemy? Whether it's dark clad Fedayeen soldiers who wear these evil Darth Vader helmets, we wanted to find somebody to blame. Now, for all of you in the audience, I don't think you realize how scary this is for somebody who's an Arab American or a Muslim American when a terrorist attack occurs. Okay. But let me put it to you this way. this way. Whether it was the events of 9-11 or any kind of explosion, any time there's an explosion in the US, I think every single Arab American is on the edge saying, or Muslim American, please don't let it be an Arab. Please don't let it be a Muslim. Please don't let it be somebody with brown skin. Okay. Because of course, what are we realizing? That one person's action is gonna affect an entire community. Uh, and to be kind of, it's, it's tragic, but if, I don't know if you remember this episode in Norway where a group of young teenage kill children were killed on an island and a bomb was set in front of the uh, Norwegian parliament. The media all of a sudden you know, jumped and said, you know, Al-Qaeda has a center of activity in Oslo. Al-Qaeda has active networks in Norway. And you can also imagine, it was tragic, but you know, Arabs in Europe, so I breathed a sigh of relief when we found the person who was guilty with blonde hair and blue eyes and a Norwegian name. Okay. And it was the same case with the attack in uh, Boston. Okay. And this came from Chechnya. That a good number of Americans were saying, oh, thank God, most Americans don't know what Chechnya is. They won't blame the Arabs. Let's just hope they don't say that, for the most part, Chechens are an ethnic group that are, for the most part, Muslim. But we see that even the confusion of Chechnya with the Czech Republic that you know, is being documented on the Twitter sphere isn't so much a testimony to America's lack of knowledge of geography, just so you know, if you're, I don't want to embarrass you, but there's Czechia, and there's the Czech Republic. And we can't blame you know, uh, clueless members of the public. Even our mainstream media gets it wrong a lot of times. Uh, this is not Egypt. This is a country called Iraq that America went to war with for 10 years. Uh, Egypt is right here. You know, the Nile, uh, the Sinai Peninsula. But anyway, so geography is not America's strong point. But nevertheless, I would argue that this process is indicative of a larger process, the search of antagonists. Okay? And this is what the media always has to do. It has to give America some kind of villain, some kind of person to epitomize the evil that occurred. Now, the problem with the antagonist of this attack, the, the young person named Joker Chernaya, what was the shock and credulity of Joker Chernaya? Wasn't that, you know, he was a terrorist, but he, you know, you had this narrative was he doesn't fit our neat categories of creating the terrorist. If you remember, what was the media saying all the time? How could he have been a terrorist? He went to the prom. He was on the wrestling team. He wore his baseball cap backwards. In other words, it didn't fit our kind of categories because he was too American to be a terrorist, you see. But nevertheless, I just want to show you how much the media constructs reality. The minute I was leaving to London, the day before the Boston Marathon thought attack. If you were watching the TV the day before the marathon attacks, you would think that we were about to go to war against North Korea. If you had watched the TV, you would have seen clips like this, alert, alert, <coughs> alert, alert. And I know I'm picking on Fox News, but it's not just Fox News that was guilty about this. You thought that America was about to go to war against a nuclear armed Korea. And then 10 years later, we're still making the same mistakes, okay? It's again, this is where science comes in. Okay. People keep on talking about you know, nuclear tip, North Korean missiles striking American targets. Again, the science doesn't tell us that North Korea has that capability, but science, we can say, just as you know, they say truth is the first casualty of war, a science also tends to be a casualty as well. We just tend to forget it. But this is kind of the argument about I'm making about how media constructs reality. Was that the North Korea threat didn't disappear on the day of the Boston Marathon attacks. What disappeared was the media's attention to that threat. Okay. And let's put it this way. If the Boston Marathon attacks hadn't occurred, if this North Korea threat hadn't occurred, what would be the major news item? Probably that explosion in Texas. 
that explosion in Texas doesn't dominate the headways because first of all, we found, you know, it wasn't man-made. It was an industrial accident, so that doesn't make it newsworthy. So, and this is what I'm talking about. Does the media still affect <coughs> our kind of reality? I would argue, yes, very much so, and it still repeats those pitfalls of 2003. So much that I would say this cartoon that emerged after the Boston Marathon attack <laughs> kind of summarizes this uh, talk succinctly. What can we do to lessen the grip of fear from terrorism, or war, or from Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or from Al Qaeda? And yes, this is absolutely it. In other words, this point is, is to show you that this creates the reality. This kind of gives, you know, the fear, the antagonist, what, the same thing that kind of entices us for an adventure or a horror flick, are the same dynamics that entice us to watch the news. And so just to kind of conclude, where are we 10 years after the 2003 Iraq War? Not very far. The only change, I would say, that came from the Iraq War 10, 2000, from 2003 is the ability for the public to become authors, for better or for worse. Even a little tweet is the public becoming authors. But with the ability of the phenomena such as the blog, uh, the pub phenomena such what it, what it's been doing is it's decentralized the means of communication. And that, I would argue, me is ultimately a beneficial thing, is that the audience does, uh, the public does have the means to communicate to wide audiences. So if we start at the beginning of this lecture, when we, you know, we were discussing World War I, there was very much a monopoly on the means of communication. There, now we can see kind of a decentralization of this process. I, I just want to conclude with a funny anecdote about art predicting reality. And if anyone wants to read a brilliant article, uh, Alyssa, what's your brother's name? Alan Seppenwald. Alan, Alan Seppenwald wrote a brilliant article about The Sopranos, about a particular episode where the kind of the, the enforcers of The Sopranos are meant to kill this Russian guy. Uh, they make a mistake, so they take him to the forest, and when they take him to the winter forest, uh, he escapes. Okay. And uh, Liz's brother was asking in this article, whatever happened to that guy who escaped from the forest? He emerges in the earlier episodes of The Sopranos, and then where, he, you know, he never really appeared. But what was funny about that episode, and why I laughed, and how I saw that was art predicting reality, was these kind of enforcers of Tony Soprano, when they were looking for this uh, veteran of the Chechen war, were saying, oh no, we have to get this guy. He fought in Czechoslovakia. Okay, so even that mistake was made in the Sopranos, but I think the Soprano writers were kind of trying to use that as a commentary on how stupid Tony Soprano's enforcers were. But unfortunately, that was art predicting reality because not only did the writers of the Sopranos kind of uh, make a comment on the stupidity of these enforcers, but it's an unfortunate fact that our public also is so quick to jump for who is the antagonist, who are our enemies, and that's also something that we have to interrogate. As a society, we like to look for the villains. As a society, what we don't try to look for is what are the conditions that produces the villains in our society, okay. such as a person like Joker or Charnayev. And I'll conclude there, and I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. He needs your questions now. <laughs> questions? I'll start. Uh, in your view, does the media portray the Iraq War as a U.S. victory? Did the media? Yeah. No, the question is when. I mean, if you looked at 2003, right afterwards, it was a outstanding victory. And then if you go, and then again, what becomes a convenient narrative when things go bad? Then again, you focused on this was now another convenient narrative because now you can take the, you know you don't interrogate how the media kind of bandwagon and justified the invasion for the war. Now the media kind of turns and says, "Look at the disaster that Iraq has become." And 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 so that that's a question: is the narratives change according to the time? And also we have to also realize it, at the same time it's easy to speak of the media, but we're also forgetting the other part of the equation. And even kind of critics of Fox News, I'll, I'll say they forget another part of the equation. What the media simply provides is a product. 
In other words, sure, you can criticize the messenger, but you also have to realize that, that these messengers exist because there's an audience that sustains them. In other words, you can have shows like The Daily Show that has a lot of fun making fun of Fox News. But you also have to question that, you know, the Fox News is the most popular in terms of audience share. It has the largest. So in other words, it's, it's not what the media was saying when, which is also important, but also how does the media say that this is what our audience wants? Our audience wanted a patriotic war right after 2001. And that was 2003, the Iraq War. Once the disaster happens and that you know young Americans are getting killed, now what does the media determine? What is the product that they, the American public wants? They, they want to know when will we get out? And so that's what I would argue is kind of, it's the media when is the important question to ask and what does the media anticipate that the, its audience wants? Laura. And who bears the responsibility? People that make it or the people that consume it? Uh, you, you, that's a chicken and egg question that's been asked by every journalist from. How could I forget his name? And good night and uh, good luck. Uh, Edward Burroughs? Yeah, Edward Burroughs. I mean, this is. And if you, if you want to watch a film about the kind of the morals of this issue, I, I'd recommend watching the film Good Night and Good Luck. And finally, you know, the final soliloquy of, his, of that film in which he concludes this question. And this, that's the question he asks Who is it responsible? It ha is the American public getting lazy and accepting these kind of vapid, you know, simplified messages? And of course, he was speaking in an age of McCarthyism. Or is it the media's responsibility? It's very much a chicken and egg question. The media producers will say, it's no, it's the audience's fault. We're giving them simply what they want. And uh, of course, critics, media critics will say, no, it's the media's fault. They construct reality for us. They, they dumb down international affairs. They create heightened senses of fear. So there is no answer. Who is, uh, it's a cyclical process. It's probably, you could say, a mutually reinforcing process. Alyssa. Um, then I'm kind of wondering, like, what are you supposed to believe in? Like, if all the media is wrong, then where do you get your facts? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's not so much what you're supposed to believe in, but, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to kind of the, uh, at least somebody in my History 102 class. I mean, what do you get from kind of understanding history is you understand the context of these events, okay? So even when we were speaking about Chechnya in last week's lecture, you understand that Chechnya didn't emerge overnight that this is a conflict that has a last long history. I, I would say number one is better understanding the context that the media has to present to you in 15 minute segments in between the commercials. <laughs> the deceased Edward Said once spoke about the media as kind of ignorant armies clashing in the night. And what was his critique, and this was back in 1991, was that it's unfortunate that the media cannot, it simply strictly doesn't have the time to convey complex issues, particularly a war like in 1991. Uh, now keep in mind, this was the age before 24-hour news. Now in the age of 24-hour news, you could say that that time constraint shouldn't exist, that you know, the media should have ample time to uh, explain complex processes, but it's still guilty of that process. But I would say what can somebody do is understand the history of particular conflicts that are represented in the media. That's one way of kind of understanding the obfuscation, the uh, distortion that usually happens in the media lens. And also depend on a lot of media, a diver diversity of information. If you watch, and it's not the language barrier that should be a problem, because you have also a variety of media, such as Al Jazeera English, giving English news from the Middle East. You have Russia today. But it's amazing how kind of reality, if you watched Russia today, you would think America would implode tomorrow. Okay. Now this is English language news. These are people speaking with perfect accents. But the way they talk about kind of the financial crisis or the kind of forces tearing apart America, the gun debate. Yeah, you would think America's on the brink of civil war. Okay. But it's kind of from exposure through those multiple sources, you create your own reality. And I'll, I'll say that's the best way to do it. But unfortunately, I mean, for people in San Marcos can't really watch Russia today on TV, at least they have to go to the internet. You can't watch Al Jazeera English on TV, you also have to go to the internet. So you can see that the corporate filter is still there, in this case, the cable company. The only place in America I think you can watch Russia today and Al Jazeera English on TV 
that is on basic cable is Detroit, which I think has a large Russian population and then has a large Arab population. Any other questions? How do you think the media handled the facts and information? Um, it fed the public following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Were we misled? Well. <laughs> okay. Now this is quite difficult because of course it's also in a very emotional episode. Uh, but I'll, I'll say, let me just an entire book have been written on this subject, so how to kind of you know, summarize an entire book on this. This is my personal take. Was I, uh, this is, and if I could say, now again, I'm also guilty because I'm lumping all the media into one category, but I would say definitely most media after 9-11, number one, I would say this is the mistake they made, was the way terrorism was communicated. I, I would say it justified the notion that a war on terrorism could succeed. It kind of absorbed the language of the war on terrorism. Very much without questioning that this language in the past isn't a reflection of reality. We declare wars on drugs. We declare wars on crime, okay? But it's really hard to declare wars on drugs or what is something a technique. And the minute we declare war on terrorism, it becomes a lot more complicated. It could have simply been called a war on Al-Qaeda. But we saw that there was an agenda much larger than you know, just simply declaring a war on Al-Qaeda. Because if you called it a war on Al-Qaeda, you couldn't bring Iraq into the equation. You couldn't bring Afga uh, Afghanistan into the equation. So I would say, the, not so much misleading, but the narrative that was constructed that terrorism is, is, is simply is a technique. It's a technique of warfare. It's uh, not considered legitimate warfare, but it's simply a technique. You can't declare war on a technique. You could declare war on Al-Qaeda, but then again, what was Al-Qaeda? That was something new for the American public a decentralized network not based in a nation state. But what did the American public want? At least what the media was saying, that we wanted a country, and Afghanistan provided that. And we saw that that wasn't necessarily the solution in the sense that America could have struck up against Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. But then what happened? It just dispersed and sprouted out you know, wings in Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, North Africa. <coughs> so you see how much more complicated it got. Yeah. I mean, if it was still in Afghanistan, it would have been much easier. But, but you see that, but that's the problem when you kind of, that's where the misleading part was. We weren't, we were told that countries, Taliban, Iraq, were responsible for the war, not a decentralized network, because that was a hard antagonist to imagine. Just like it's hard to imagine this young American kid planting a bomb. So I would say that's where the process of misleading occurred was the, the, you know, how the threat was depicted to the American public. And what the American public immediately wanted was some kind of revenge. And Afghanistan, you know, provided that convenient target for revenge. Uh, at one point, did our, did our news go from being a public service provided in exchange for um, spectrum to something that's more capitalistic and, and you know, like infotainment, where people are trying to make money. Like, when, when did that shift occur? Again, I need an entire book, but uh, okay, okay. Uh, we could say a couple of points. Uh, if you remember in the Vietnam War, here you had kind of the media not massage. You had journalists who were able to go anywhere. And the problem with those journalists who were able to go anywhere was they were able to bring an image of Vietnam to the American household, <coughs> particularly at a time when most Americans by that point had a TV, and present a narrative of the war that was contrary to how the government wanted the public to see the Vietnam War. <laughs> and you know, you had cases where, you know, Conkite or various prominent journalists saying that the war is lost. I, I think it was after that phenomena where kind of the media had its what was called its fourth estate role. As a, you know, the media was envisioned ideally as a watchdog on government abuse. Okay. So we could say after the Vietnam War, I think you have this realization among the government that, among governments, uh, that the conveying of warfare has to be massage, control. Okay. And so of course in 2003, what was that famous process called? It was called embedding journalists. Okay. Which critics said it wasn't the embedding, the journalists were literally in bed with you know, the narrative of how, you know, the how the war should have been portrayed. 
So it's somewhere between Vietnam and 2003. But uh, it's also, the, remember, it's a transformation of how international conflict is depicted, but also domestic politics. You also have to ask yourself a question, when did, let's say, presidential campaigns move from the issues that the candidates are espousing to the actual personality of the presidential candidate? And usually Clinton is blamed for this. We could even say it was Reagan, to some extent, creating the president as a spectacle, rather than as a, uh, a president who was about a particular set of issues. So it's, there's not one concrete date, but it's some, it's, it has to do at some time with the rise of every American household to afford a TV, and between the Vietnam War and the 1991 Gulf War, we have the shift. And of course, with the rise of cable TV, where you can have 24-hour news channels, such as CNN, <coughs> where the need to generate revenue has to be on a 24-hour basis. Remember, before 1990s, the news only occurred half an hour every night. Seven o'clock news. And sometimes you watch it in the morning. But it's also with that 24-hour news cycle that it becomes a lot more complicated. I'll take one more question then, and then um, let you go to class. I have a question. Uh, how would you suggest the public to manage the news media as today, like the bombs, like how can, like what would you suggest Americans to do so like that they're not afra afraid of like attacks, of bombs, of uh, Yeah, this is my suggestion. <coughs> yeah, that, <laughs> no, 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 yeah, yes. but like, if, if, if we were to do that, like, we would never No, no, be it's not this. I, I, I would say, yeah. it's, it's again, the variety of sources of information. And it's, it's kind of ironic that you're in your generation, I mean, one of the most trusted sources of news information now has become the Daily Show and the Colbert Report, which isn't necessarily bad. Through, I mean, it is political humor, it is fake news, but sometimes satire has that critical, cap you know, that critical nature of the mainstream media that's very valuable. Uh, so, I mean, I don't want to push a particular news show, but yeah, they, sometimes I tell the students, you watch the Daily Show and Colbert Report. At least you're getting a little bit of information. Sure, it's in an entertainment format. Sure, it has a particular angle. But it's the ability to kind of critique narratives. That's what these kind of political satire shows uh, deliver to, let's say, uh, young students who want a variety or want an ability to criticize how information is conveyed. Okay, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you.